We should add this to the party. Okay. From Mark Stein. Long time. Illustrious NBA reporter. First, there's a paragraph about how the Clippers are pretty likely to find a Paul George trade market out there. Pretty likely that they'll want to trade him. They've been negotiating for a while. Paul doesn't like what they're saying. And so there's probably going to be some sort of a deal there. Stein adds this, and I even heard um, Gel Tyler say to, to Steiny and Evan earlier today, Paul George and the Knicks, that's a good match. Paul George and the Knicks. Well, Mark just wrote this, quote, I'm pretty sure that the Warriors are as interested in George as the Knicks. Maybe more. Can Golden State assemble the likely multi-team trade that would be needed to win the PG-13 sweepstakes? Stay tuned. The Warriors, as usual, are aggressively exploring trade options with the Chris Paul contract situation we've been writing about for a month at the center of those efforts. End quote. Mark Stein, and for those of you who don't know what the Chris Paul contract situation he's been writing about is, well, Chris, with a deadline currently that sits at July 28th, that is, checks math, Friday of this week? Friday. All right. So uh, that's currently the deadline. They are attempting to push that deadline back beyond July 1st when free agency actually begins. But Chris right now has a non-guaranteed $30 million deal for next year. Warriors can waive him. Mike Dunleavy even said so. Could waive him. Could keep him. I don't think that's going to happen. That's code for could waive him. Could keep him because we found a trade. So if you keep him, that means that basically either you're signing up for that $30 million next year and somebody may want to acquire him as an expiring deal. Or if you can move that deadline back, I do believe you can trade him as a 30, and I don't know this for sure, but I think you could trade him as a $30 million contractual piece that the other team can then acquire and immediately cut. Yeah. Just pay Chris five to go away, and it opens up a bunch of money on your cap. And that, I think, is the backbone of what Mark Stein was writing about as far as multi-team trades because you need to have a team out there that's willing to take on the Chris Paul contract and then pay him the $5 million for him to go away. And you'd have to incentivize that team with a pick and then that team would probably also get another pick from another team that was involved in a three- or four-team trade. And you see these a lot of times in the NBA where there's so many players and picks flying around, and it all works out for the money. There's usually a team that just wants picks. There's another team that's willing to take on money to get rid of that player and have some financial relief. And then another team that's looking to add a veteran piece. Uh, let's go there for a second. Okay, Paul George, what do you think? I mean, he's he's a good player. <laughs> he's getting up there. He can he kind of fits the bill as far as, you yeah, know, yeah. another veteran on a veteran laden team. Yeah. Paul George is thirty four and you know, he's a guy who I think fits as far as what you need. You need more wing depth. He was healthier this past year than he's been the previous handful of years before. So that's exciting. And yep. he's still a very good, very productive player. And he provides exactly what this team lacks, which is size on the wing and length. Shot over 41% from three-point range last year. Played 74 games. uh, Averaged 22.6 a game and was an all-star. Again, for the, I don't know, umpteenth time in his uh, career. uh, 33, about to turn 34. Maybe he already has, actually. Yeah, uh, turned uh, turned thirty four in May. Years of age, yeah, just uh, just did ninety percent free throw shooter. Uh, averaged a little bit over five rebounds a night. I mean, he's Paul George. Paul George is a fantastic player. Um, w- the one concern I have about all of these ideas is continuity. Like, I just I'm a big big believer in the NBA, and if the Warriors, it's already a stretch to me for the Warriors to believe that a core that's this old can truly compete for a championship, and we should actually address the way Mike Dunleavy answered that because he said something real interesting in there. I think it's already a little bit of a stretch. 
Um, so to, to then add in a new player who simply replaces your other 34 year old, granted a healthier 34 year old. And he's better than Clay. And he's better. He's more of an all around presence on the, on the court. I get all of those things, but to simply do that and have it be someone new who's never played with Steph, who's never been in, in Steve Kerr's offense. I just, to me, that feels like something that's going to take at least a season of getting used to. And then, and then where are you? Yeah. Now everybody's just a year older. That's one of the reasons I, I remain intrigued by, by exploring the Kevin Durant sweepstakes, which I don't even know to what level they exist, or maybe they're knee deep in those conversations as well. And they're, and they're laying in the weeds. But I love the idea of somebody who's already done this before joining the team again. Yeah, I know what you're saying about that part of it. I, I think, you know, Paul George being younger and, he, you know, you could debate who was better last year. I think Kevin Durant probably still better offensively. I like Paul George's ability to, to defend for the Golden State Warriors. And you definitely need more wing defense that you were desperately lacking this year. The other part of it is if you do trade for Paul George, he's going to want a contract. Correct. He's playing, he's going to pick up his player option, and it's the final year of his deal. So if you do acquire Paul George, it does come with that caveat where he's probably going to want, a th what, a three- or four-year extension on top of the one year he already has? I'm sure he's going to want four. I don't I don't know if he'll get it, but that, that to me, is another interesting wrinkle here um and you know you say he's definitely going to pick up his player option if he gets dealt somewhere maybe he won't maybe it's going to be I, I'll, I'll decline my player option in in exchange for a brand new three or four year deal that that you're going to execute i have no idea what the number would be for paul george it's 48.7 is the player option for this year right so that's the arena you're talking about, again, years are always, in my opinion, more important than the number. So could the number come down a little bit in favor of years? Sure, it could. But if everything is all about this timeline that's kind of been created by Steph Curry, how does Paul George match up with that? It feels to me like not very well, unless you're hoping – Paul George to be some sort of gap bridger yeah. on the other side of Steph Curry. He can be your veteran piece um, as Jonathan Kaminga becomes 25 and and, and all of that stuff. I, I don't know, but uh, this is a pricey option and one whose years don't match up exactly right. Yeah, the Kevin Durant years do kind of match yep. up because he's got two years left, although the money is richer. Either one of those players you bring in, you're probably going to be flirting with that second apron line again. And Mike Dunleavy, when he spoke earlier in our show, he had his pre-draft availability. He didn't completely rule out the idea of them again going over the second apron line. He did say, though, that it has to make sense on a number of levels to, to go ahead and go up to that level again. Yeah. Uh, now, the other thing uh, that, that he said, this is the first time I've ever heard Mike Dunleavy reference this. And uh, throughout, like especially in the 5 o'clock hour, because Monty Poole's coming up here in 20 minutes. But we will bring back some of the commentary from Mike Dunleavy if uh, you missed it. But he just had his pre-draft media availability. We had it right here on 95.7 The Game. It's the first time I've ever heard him make a reference to the idea of the age of the core and how long they can still compete for a championship. And I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but there was a reference to... Like, we're not there yet, but these guys are going to have to realize at their age kind of like how, how much time is left with regard to their ability to compete for a championship. He said that in conjunction with an answer about not wanting to give up on these young players and include them in a trade because he's very much stated a goal of, yes, we do want to compete right now. But we also want to continue to be very good uh, into the future and, and beyond the, the big three. It's an interesting, like, it sounds like, well, duh. He wants to be good, and then they want to be good. Like, what did he say there, Mark? Well, I think there was something in there almost maybe about wanting to dispel this idea that's out there that the Warriors are only about the next two years. Right. And they do not care about anything else other than that. Um, maybe they do. But they don't want it to feel that way. They certainly don't want to say that publicly. 
So that was the first time I've heard him sort of talk about the guys and their age. Two timelines is back, Mark, is what I heard him say. <laughs> oh, great. Two timelines, baby. We're back in business. But if you're Mike Dunleavy, it doesn't do you a lot of good to go all in on the next two years and blow up the future. So if you don't win a title in the next two years and Steph retires and Draymond's up and Wiggins is going to walk and now you're Mike Dunleavy and you're left with, with nothing because you traded Kaminga, you traded Moody, you got Pods this year's second round pick, Usman Garuba, and now Mike Dunleavy's looking for work. So it doesn't do a lot for him to, you know, go ahead and go all eggs in one basket for the sure. next two years. Although you're right, it is mostly just him saying it publicly so they maintain some leverage. Yeah. I do have that let's sound clip for you guys if you want it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. And just so everybody knows, the first the question that brought everybody into it, it was he was asked about the key to actually making a big trade this time of the year. Okay. I think we have to be realistic and uh, I don't want to like press and over overdo something. Um, some patience needs to, to take place while at the same time recognizing sort of this time horizon we have with um, Steph and Draymond and, you know, hopefully Clay as, as those guys kind of get a little bit older, uh, we have to be mindful of, at a point, maybe they're not at a level to compete for a championship. I don't think that's like too near, but at some point it probably will be. Okay. I don't think it's like too near, but it's like kind of near. <laughs> <laughs> well, like not this year, but kind of maybe sort of this year. Maybe like, yeah. it is here. I mean, you know, well, nobody knows. It sure felt like last year, if a couple things would have gone their way, they feel like they still were in that championship sort of well, window or, you know, championship adjacent window. I and think then you're the 10 seed and you realize, well, you know, if Draymond plays more and, you know, if, man, if we get Paul George or KD, we're right back in uh, it. You're, cl you're talking about the classic rub with the Warriors organization right now. Yeah. I mean, if you really want to just draw a line in the middle of the fan base, this is how you do it. Everybody over here, get over here on the right if you think that the Warriors are still uh, competitors for a title and if they were just a non-Draymond suspension away from being the five seed. All of you, you go over here on the right side of this line. Okay. Everybody thinks that that's an absolutely ridiculous tale. This thing's over, and nobody will admit it. You get over here on the left side of the line. What's the bigger side? The left side. You think so? The left side, yeah. <laughs> it's probably a two-to-one ratio, two-thirds to one-third of you know left side, right side. And one free agent signing or one big trade here in the next week can swing a lot of those people from the left over to the right. No doubt. Well, I, he, here's what I also hear. I hear this with, with Mike Donlevy. And so when he says, hey, yeah, we want to be good now. We want to be good in the future. Boy, I would sure be shocked if we got rid of any of our young guys. But the old guys are still championship ready. I mean, maybe they won't be for long, but they are now. Look, it, it's, it's keeping all options on the table. It is keeping your negotiating position high. You want the rest of the world. And this is, by the way, I'm not, I don't want to betray any confidences. I didn't talk to Bob Fitz off the air at all. I love Bob. When he said last week, I mean, the word just didn't, right? Clay, resign, right? Just Draymond, don't get suspended. This team can compete with everyone. He said that. I, I think that this is an organizational effort right now. They want the world to believe that they think their roster's fine. It's just like going to buy a car. You better have a car that you showed up in. If you took an Uber and that salesperson sees that you took an Uber, they're going to be like, this person doesn't have a car. You want that salesperson to know, I got a car. I don't need to buy a car today. I'm interested, but I don't have to unless you give me a good deal. The Warriors are sitting here. They want the world to think that they think their roster is just fine. My belief is they don't. They don't, because every single reporter that we've heard, Mark Stein, what we just read you is the most recent. Every single one, here's the most important thing that was said to me in that Mark Stein piece, okay? Um, there's the part about Paul George, and then this line. The Warriors, as usual, are aggressively exploring trade options. There's your sentence. That, to me, that's what's going on right now. Mike just, you know, put his feet up on an automobile. Oh, we're, we're good. 
I mean, you know, it's going to be weird having two days of draft. Am yeah. I right? And you know, four minutes instead of five in the second round, and it's going to be an adjustment. Do any of you know how hard it is to make a trade in the NBA? It's really like hard, crazy hard, super like, hard. I mean, it's like a four leaf clover. Like, what are we talking about here? That's probably not going to happen. I don't think there are going to be any trades in the NBA this off season. Way too hard. Yeah, way too hard. But I tell you what, our young guys, boy, they're great. Am I right? Like, really good young players. We would hate to get rid of any of them. And we want Clay back, too. Thank you for coming to Chase Center and listening to my TED Talk. Good night, everybody. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. I just don't think that's what's going on. I think the Warriors are freaking out and 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 trying to make something happen. Yeah, I don't know if I would freaking go so out far. Is the wrong. Like, no, but I, I don't mean they're like stressed. When but you I said think freaking out, the first thing I thought of is Joe Lacob in Sacramento. And now he wasn't freaking out, but he was freaking mad. He was mad. He was mad. Yes. And he should have been mad because not only were you in the play-in, and he had already gone on our station and talked about, no, we're not, our plan is to never be a lottery team again. Well, 0 for 1 on that front because uh, you're a lottery team and you didn't have your pick because it got conferred. Unless you were top three, you lose it and you lost it. So. Not only were you in the lottery, but you lost the lottery, and you lost your pick. And so, yeah, <laughs> see you in the second round, guys. Yeah. So he's not freaking out, but he's freaking mad. And no, they I should didn't. be freaking mad. Yeah. And it's two more years of staff, maybe more. Who knows what the window is, but you got to fix this thing. I mean, I guess my point is Mike Dunleavy, when you listen to him talk, does not sound aggressive. Yeah. But I think he's being incredibly aggressive. I, I, I just don't think the Warriors take kindly to the way that ended. Right, and I at think all. you know when it comes to being aggressive, there's only so much you can do at this point. And you know you're going to try to find the best player you can with your second round pick. And he was even asked about the idea of that player being rostered this year, and he's like, "Yeah, you know, of course you'd love to, but you know these second round picks, it's not quite one in a million, but it's close." And he mentioned you know the Joker, and he mentioned Draymond Green, and a couple of other second round hits. Hard to find him, although they did last year with TJD. 888-957-9570. Monty Poole, NBC Sports Bay Area, dialed in, Warrior Insider. He joins us in 10 minutes. Let's go out to you, Austin in San Jose on Willard and Dibs. Hey, Austin, what's cooking? Hey, my guy Willard, man. Damn, I, I actually agree with you. Um, what I say? You know, um, I'll change it. Dunleavy, I mean, well, listen, a couple things. Dunleavy <laughs> is, I think he's being honest with you, man. I mean, Listen, the whole thing about it, I think he told you that this Oscar is old. I mean, I don't think he has to do We're not talking two years from now. I think he, he basically told you. Uh, by the way, I saw Dunleavy at, at San Jose State games. This guy is out there in the, in the road doing his thing. This isn't some guy that's sitting in a suit, uh, you know, projecting on a screen. This guy is actually out there recruiting. So I have a lot of faith in Dunleavy if you give him time. But the reality is that, yeah, the Warriors got to do something now. This isn't about, like, two years from now. Um uh, and this isn't really a criticism of Clay Thompson, but I think Clay Thompson represents, unfortunately, timing wise, what the Warriors need to do. They need to move on, um, whatever that looks like. So I don't, I don't think we need to prolong that discussion. And, and Bibley, you know, whether it's two aprons or garments or whatever, you know, I know that people fixate on all this, all this machinations on finance, but the reality is that for me, I want to go see a better product. I mean, I, I went to the New Orleans game this year, guys, and paid my hard earned money. Uh, which I don't have a lot of. And that was one of the worst games. People were walking out early. I didn't walk out, um, just to be on the record. But there were people that were walking out. Joe Lakeup, I did fixate on him. He was pacing back and forth. And then Clay Thompson, and again, I don't want to raid on Clay Thompson, but he made a statement after the game saying, you know, he didn't care, didn't, didn't, didn't keep him up at night and all that stuff. So I'm saying, hey, you know what? And Steph Curry, in the same sentence, the same question about that game, said, no, we owe the we owe the fans something to cheer about. So I think there's two different perspectives here. I'm not sure Clay Thompson really understands, you know, the totality of what he represents, uh, what he has represented for the Warriors. So I, I just want to see the Warriors be a better product, whether it's with Clay, without Clay. I, I don't think they're a better product with Clay. I'm all in on poor Paul George. Not as much on um Jimmy Butler, though, I don't think Jimmy Butler would be a good idea for the locker room. And then the question I have, guys, last thing I have, I'm concerned about the Josh Giddy um, Caruso thing. I really thought Caruso would be a great addition for the Warriors. And it makes me wonder the value of the Warriors' young guys. Why would they jump to that trade and not 
consider the Warriors young guys. It makes me wonder how valuable they really are outside of Warrior Land. That's well, all I got, guys. Yeah, Thank Austin, thanks. Austin. thanks. I, I think the Bulls badly, badly misplayed the Caruso thing. My understanding over the last couple of seasons, they had a bunch of offers that were more significant than what they ended up walking away with. Josh Giddy, uh, interesting story, interesting player, very young. Maybe he does become really a thing. But I think Caruso at the last two deadlines could have fetched you a lot. And I don't know if it was necessarily the Warriors wanting to give up their young players, but I think there were teams lining up some pretty significant draft capital as an offer for Alex Caruso, and the Bulls held. And they held, yeah. and they held, and they held, and they held too long. Uh, that's that's just that's my read on the Caruso situation. I don't think it says much about the Warriors' young guys. I think the Bulls just misplayed their hand. Yeah, and I don't know if the Warriors were you know in on the Caruso talks when that trade went down a week or so ago, and if they if they weren't or if they were and they just missed out, that's too bad because he would have been a perfect kind of player for the Warriors to add if they were gonna look to reshuffle some of their young guys. My bet is not this time, but they were months ago. Right. And, and the Bulls price was, was too high. And, um, and then the price went down. Right. Because the offers kind of went away. Like his name's been out there for a while now. I think it was last deadline, not even this one. Yeah. 20, 2023 deadline. And I think that the Warriors right now are of a different mindset where they're looking for the big swings at the top of the market. Agreed. And, you know, disres- no disrespect to Caruso, but he's not that. And just to address the aprons with Austin and San Jose, I also don't care about the aprons. If the Warriors are over that second apron, it doesn't bother me, but it bothers the ownership, I think. And we're going to see how they act accordingly, but... They've said it's a priority to to not spend so much in luxury taxes, but for me, I I want to see exactly what you do, Austin. I want to see the best possible team I can. I don't think it's just about money either. By the way, you're over the second apron too long; it, it becomes very punitive, yeah. and, and building your roster becomes impossible. And and that's what they need to do. Like I mean, those two things are linked. You want a better product, you got to have a better roster. So that's what they're trying to do. Mike and Marin, hey, you're next on Willard and Dibs. Hey, what's up, Mike? Hey guys, how you doing? It, I, 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 th- the Warriors to me, they, they're in a obviously a very difficult situation, and I have to say, I, I lay the blame all on the feet of Draymond Green. I, I truly believe, uh, and I've been a Warrior fan since Run TMC a long, long time. I, I and I've been a Draymond fan because so, I'm from Michigan and I love Mich- you know, Michigan State basketball, but I, it, it, I put this all on Draymond. The, the punch, I, and nobody's really. Said this, I think that started the a whole domino from crashing down, uh, and that and I, I believe this last year had, had pool been in place, everybody everything had stayed the same, <clears throat> other you know, in getting their new guys. I think they could have definitely competed for a championship this year for mm-hmm. sure. Um, and I, I really do blame that on Draymond. I don't, and I right now, given that it's, you know, so what? It's it's some water under the bridge. I don't. Um, I do not think they should trade Kaminga or uh, Jackson Davis and go for older guys. I Mike, just don't. Y- yeah, th- thanks so much. I, I, the, the Draymond comments probably got plenty of people nodding their head. I will forever walk away from this entire experience um, scratching my head with regard to what people think Jordan Poole could be going forward or even would have been last year. I understand what he was. It was far from all bad. Jordan, uh, big contributions to a championship, worked his butt off, got another contract. All salute to that. Uh, Jordan Poole is now showing you um, what a a financially sound Jordan Poole looks like. And uh, at age like 24, uh, he's even said out loud, we're all set. We're all good here. All of the goals have been uh, achieved. I'm the opposite of bullish on what Jordan Poole could have been going forward with the Warriors. Yeah, still a long way to go, but first season in Washington was anything but bullish. It was bearish, shooting uh, 41%, not from three, from the floor. (laughs) From everywhere. From the floor. Yeah, not, not good at all. All right, much more to say on all of